regarding Moses and the heavy hands. The Torah relates, Shemos 17 and 11, that during the war, when Moshe held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, then Amalek prevailed. But Moshe's hands were heavy, and Aaron and Chur, who accompanied him, supported his hands. Rashi comments, Because he was lax in the commandment of waging war, and appointed another in his stead, Yahashua, his hands became heavy. We see then that Moshe Rabbeinu should have gone to battle, and when he did not, was punished for his laxity. All of the above reasons why Moshe considered himself unable to join in the actual battle, and not that, God forbid, he was slothful, poses the inevitable question, why was Moshe punished? His hands became heavy for doing something which was seemingly so logical. Rashi answers this question by saying that Moshe was punished for being lax in the mitzvah, and not for being lax in going out to war. For since the war against Amalek was a mitzvah, a commandment from God, Moshe should have gone to war, and not entertained any of the thoughts to the contrary no matter how reasonable or logical. A mitzvah must be such that we will obey, and then we will hear. First, one does the deed without entering into any calculations. And since Moshe was lax in the mitzvah, he entered into calculations as to what was best for the conduct of the war, etc. He was punished. All the above is from Shabbos, Parshas, Yisro, 19th day of Shabbat, 574-1-1981 at ribby.org, edited. Rashi commenting on Genesis 17 and 3. And Abram fell upon his face. And God spoke with him, saying, <clears throat> and here's the commentary, And Abram fell upon his face, Midrash form, from fear of the Shekinah. For as long as he was uncircumcised, he did not have the strength to stand when the divine presence stood over him. And that is what is said concerning Malam. In Numbers 24 and 4, who falls and his eyes are open. Uh, also, Numbers, Rabbi 12 and 8. I found this in the Baritha of Rabbi Eliezer, Eliezer, Perke de Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 29. Uh, this is verse 6, 7, 8, 9 of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water, that it may separate water from water. God made the expanse, and it separated the water which was below the expanse, from the water which was above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. God said, let the water below the sky be gathered into one area, that the dry land may appear. And it was so. This is Genesis 49 and 24. Yet his bow stayed taut, and his arms were made firm by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. There, the shepherd, the rock of Israel. This is from Ezekiel chapter 
4, verses 4 through 8. Then lie on your left side and let it bear the punishment of the house of Israel. For as many days as you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. For I impose upon you 390 days, corresponding to the number of the years of their punishment. And so you shall bear the punishment for the house of Israel. When you have completed these, you shall lie another 40 days on your right side and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. I impose on you one day for each year. Then, with bared arm, set your face toward besieged Jerusalem and prophesy against it. Now, I put cords upon you so that you cannot turn from side to side until you complete your days of siege. This is from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And he said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. This is from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. A spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness in the fury of my spirit, while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And I came to the exile community that dwelt in Tel Abib by the Shibar Canal. And I remained there, and I remained where they dwelt. And for seven days I sat there stunned among them. This is from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 22, 23, and 24. Then the hand of the Lord came upon me there, and he said to me, Arise, go out to the valley, and there I will speak to you. I arose and went out to the valley, and there stood the presence of the Lord, like the presence that I had seen at the Shibar Canal. And I flung myself down on my face. And a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And he spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. Okay, here's my commentary on everything I just read to you. I know the heaviness of the hands of Moshe. And I know how Jacob's arms were made firm by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. I have been in a constant state of punishment by the power of God since I offered myself and my soul for guilt to him as the man described in Isaiah 53. That would be verse 10. It is punishment, but there is far more to it than just that. It also was telling Moshe that God was there and that he was in charge of the battle. And this, this punishment changes you over time. God is also making you a better prophet. The heaviness is his presence. It is what I feel of his very essence as he would have me experience it. For a man, it can feel like punishment But there is a positive to it. It tells me after 13 years that he never leaves me. God also has me enveloped in his power. The same cords of his power that God placed on Ezekiel to confine him to his house and prevent Ezekiel from turning from one side to the other for 430 days as he bore the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah for their sins. It doesn't say sins, but that's what the punishment would be for. Then there's a reference to, okay. The same heaviness that requires the person of the spirit of the Holy God to set Ezekiel upon his feet. And that's not real explicit. You know, it sounds more like he just fell down or he flung himself down. Well, he may have known it or not known it. 
But God slowed me down many times and then lifted me back up. Again, in other videos, you, you, you see this mentioned over and over again, the fire refiner. God is, uh, God's boot camp. He's, he's the sergeant and you're the cadet and he's going to put you through it. The heaviness that required Moses to have the strength to stand when a divine presence stood over him. The verses from Genesis associate waters of the unseen realm of God with the waters of the earth. Unseen waters that are above the sky. Because that's the partition. These unseen waters above the sky, that's an element of God's unseen realm that we can't understand or see or know much about. And it's best associated with the waters of the earth. Unseen waters partitioned above and below heaven. Sky. Those below heaven fill the universe and are a part of God's presence. With his power, these unseen waters can do anything that he wills them to do. And God senses and can see the movement of every single thing and person in creation by and through them. Think of a submarine uh, in the ocean and they send out a ping and it's a sound wave. And it goes, it, it'll, it'll go around, uh, you know, rocks and other other submarines, this and that. And so you get a picture of what's out there. It's something like that. He doesn't have eyes like human beings. Long ago, God took me to a heavenly room in a vision. A vision in body, not in spirit. The purpose was to learn how to bear up to the weight of his presence and these waters that covered the earth when I was walking with him in the course of his power that enveloped me. It, can make you, it was making me very nauseous. I could feel my body so acutely and real in that room that creation passing before the window actually made me feel car sick as the weight of his presence and the power around, around me to offset it was manipulated at his will. It's a little bit complicated, but I've actually spoken about this in, in other uh, videos. Think of a cardboard box that has been left in a rain or placed in a body of water. It is so light before and so heavy afterwards. The water soaks through the box through and through and retains the water even when lifted. My body is that box. Even my insides can be heavy. Though God decides in his power how much weight I feel at any given moment with the cores of his power. When the vision was over and I was back in the world, the weight of God's presence was much easier to live with. The weight of God's presence is primarily from the waters divided below heaven that cover the earth, but also form from his power that flows from his presence. Okay, this finishes my commentary on the punishment of the heavy hands. I have one more to do on the prophet like Moses. I'm going to take a little break and uh, put on uh, the Havitka and the raising of the Israel flag in the Temple Mount.
prophet like Moses. Verses 15, 16, 17, and 18 of chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. This is Moses talking to the Israelites. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from among your own people, like myself. Him you shall heed. This is just what you ask of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear the voice of the Lord my God any longer, or see this wondrous fire any more, lest I die. Whereupon the Lord said to me, uh, This is the Lord to Moses, They had done well in speaking thus, I will raise up a prophet for them from among their own people, like yourself. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all that I command him. This is this is several verses of of Exodus uh, chapter 7 verses 1 through 31 you understand why I'm reading this much in it because I don't have commentary on it It's actually, it starts with verse 12, not, not 1. Now, go. And this is God to Moses. Now, go, and I will be with you as you speak and will instruct you what to say. But he said, please, O oh Lord, make someone else your agent. The Lord became angry with Moses, and he said, there is your brother Aaron the Levite. He, I know, speaks readily. Even now, he is setting out to meet you, and he will be happy to see you. You shall speak to him and put the words in, the, in his mouth. I will be with you and with him as you speak, and tell both of you what to do. And he shall speak for you to the people. Thus, he shall serve as your spokesman, with you playing the role of God to him. And take with you this rod, which you shall perform the signs. Moses went back to his father-in-law, Jethro, and said to him, Let me go back to my kinsmen in Egypt and see how they are faring. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. The Lord said to Moses in Medean, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who sought to kill you were dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, mounted them on an ass, and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God with him. And the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the marvels that I have put within your power. I, however, will stiffen his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I have said to you, Let my son go, that he may worship me. Yet you refuse to let him go. Now I will slay your firstborn son. At a night encampment on the way, the Lord encountered him and sought to kill him. Him is Moses. So Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his legs with it, saying, You are truly a bridegroom of blood to me. And when, and when he let him alone, she added, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, Go to meet Moses in the wilderness. He went and met him at the mountain of God, and he kissed him. 
Moses told Aaron about all the things that the Lord had committed to him and all the signs about which he had instructed him. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron repeated all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and he performed the signs in the sight of the people. And the people were convinced. When they heard that the Lord had taken note of the Israelites and that he had seen their plight, they bowed low in homage. Again, that's verses 12 through 31 of Exodus chapter 7. Commentary. I am the prophet like Moses. For many reasons, but these in particular, for the reasons that like Moses, I speak to God face to face. God speak, speaks to me as a friend. I converse with God whenever I so wish. God talks directly to me when he so desires. And I write God's words at his directions. And I can add, and I put on videos at his command and speak the words he commands me to speak. He had me type everything I'm reading. He said, go to Texas, type this down, or paste, uh, uh, copy it and paste it on your note notebook pad. And like Moses, I bring a redemption. The redemption of the new covenant of God declared in Jeremiah chapter 31 to be delivered in a time to come. This time. The time of the fulfillment of all biblical prophecy. The time God speaks to his prophets again. When God said, there's Aaron. Even now, he is setting out to meet you, and he will be happy to see you. God is placing a short vision into the mind of Moses. Aaron and Moses do not meet for many days after this at the mountain of God. It is not a trance-like vision where Moses feels that he is in another place in time away from the world. It is more like an image of an event on television that you remember after you have watched it. A little bit sharper than that. It is a vision that goes more to your mind than to your eye. The image would have been of Aaron walking out of his dwelling place, and together with God's words, he is setting out to meet you. Moses knows that Aaron is on his way where they are to meet at the mountain. So, it, 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 it's, okay, this is the way God communicates with Moses and the way he communicates with me. I listen to his words and he often sends to me picture visions, as does the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, they're always together. It is not a confirmation of God's words so much as it is a more perfect way to communicate words with pictures. Often it is just picture visions that have instant meaning to me. God says to Moses, I will be with you and with him as you speak and tell both of you what to do. God often tells me what to do and say when I'm talking with another person. But our level of communication is such that I don't have to actually hear him. He can put knowledge into my mind as I speak. He can take control of what I speak. He can take control of my body and mind and put in different words than I would have used. He is always with me. I am a host of the Lord of hosts. That means God dwells with me. Now, the communication with God and Aaron is much more limited than the communication between God and Moses. Moses is to speak the words God gives him to Aaron for Aaron to speak to Pharaoh. And God is telling Aaron what to do with the words, such as when to deliver them and the tongue to use. Because God says, I'm going to speak to both of you. and But, but all the words he's speaking in are coming from Moses. So that's what will be left. When to deliver them, how to deliver them. God tells Moses that Aaron will be his spokesman with, 
Moses playing the role of God and Aaron being his prophet as Moses delivers God's words to Aaron to be spoken to Pharaoh. When Moses speaks the words of God to another person, God is speaking through him. Just as God is speaking through me in this video and in all 63 videos that we've prepared over the last month and a week or two. And uh, they're, they're all based on two books that he dictated to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. I had to learn everything first, but every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every chapter are his. Um, the first book is about 285 pages long, but that's with about a 30-page addendum, which is a summary of each chapter in a paragraph or so. And it's called Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. And in that book, we, he, he, I say we, what he wanted was for me to never say this, that I am this man. But reading it, you almost can't escape it. At least the thought is, is this, is he saying, because it would be things like, how do you know Elijah? Well, he'll know everything you can know about heaven. And I've got several chapters that are all just about heaven, things that aren't generally thought of or known. So the implication is there. But now the next book we did um, is called The Life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. And it's my life. It's my life. God didn't speak to me, and I was an atheist for 50 years until I was 50, but he was with me from birth to make sure I fit every verse of Isaiah 53, and particularly wounding. He was wounded. Well, I've got 15 surgical scars, and I've been shot to the abdomen, and and pale my right knee on a broken glass bottle, and et cetera, et cetera. I was like the most accident prone person you ever wanted to meet. Little did I know I was being prepared for this time. I'm now 63. Um, and so the life of God's righteous servant, it's my life. And he dictated that to me. Of course, I didn't have to learn it first. I, I just had to remember, and he puts remembrance into my mind. I can remember like no other human being on this planet. He can have me not only remember an event, the first time I drove a car, for instance, kissed a girl, but he can make it, he can bring it back to me as though it's actually happening again. It's not just, I know when I drove a car, I was so excited and it felt so great. No, I feel the excitement. Okay, the ambience of the day. Everything is there. But he can do, and he can do the same thing when you get shot through the abdomen on a ranch in Texas. Like it's happening all over again. Just to show me what was really going on that day and what he had to do with it. Controlling my perceptions. Thanks for listening.